to the people of Bermuda. Last Friday, I provided an update in the House of Assembly on the latest estimates relating to the 2021-22 budget as the government prepares for the annual audit of the Consolidated Fund. Based on the latest estimates, I'm happy to report that the budget deficit estimate for the previous fiscal year is now projected to be $81 million, compared to the $125 million deficit originally estimated in the 2021-22 budget statement. The $44 million improvement is primarily driven by a $74 million increase in revenue and a $17 million decrease in capital account expenditures, offset by a $42 million increase in current account expenditure and a $3.5 million increase in expenses related to the Morgan's Point project. These results demonstrating that we are exceeding our targets that were laid out in Bermuda's economic recovery plan and will reach a balanced budget with far less of an increase in debt than was predicted just two years ago. The revenue for 2021-22 is projected to be $1.07 billion, which is 7% above the original estimates of $999 million. And this is primarily due to increases in customs duties, stamp duty, civil aviation, payroll tax, and increased revenue from the Bermuda Travel Authorization. Current account expenditure for 2021-2022 is projected to be $945 million, $42 million above the original estimates, recognizing that over half of this increased amount is a result of higher than expected COVID expenditures, including continued payments to Skyport. The continued payments to Skyport directly affect the average Bermudian. While the over $40 million paid to Skyport during the pandemic should have been used to provide further relief to hardworking families, instead, it was paid to Skyport, which helped their parent company, Acon, approve a dividend increase for their shareholders in April of this year. This, people of Bermuda, is why elections matter. The public should also note that while interest on government debt remain relatively stable, the government continued to cover the costs of the failed Morgan's Point project inherited by the Progressive Labour Party government, which was $3.5 million more than expected. It is regrettable to date that the government has had to pay over $210 million to honour an obligation made by the One Bermuda Alliance government, as these payments have limited government resources significantly, increased the country's debt, and these resources could have otherwise been used to better assist the people of Bermuda during these difficult times. Despite that, we continue to effectively manage the economy and the declining deficit and GDP growth that was seen in 2021 helped to demonstrate a strengthening economy aided by the government's commitment to sound finance and ensuring that we remain on a path to a balanced budget still targeted for the 2024 fiscal year. As I shift focus from the previous fiscal year's performance to our current fiscal year, I'm once again encouraged by the first quarter numbers the Ministry of Finance has received to date. Once again, strong payroll tax, land tax, stamp duty, customs duty, and tourism-related revenue have not only offset the income lost from the aircraft register, as a result of the Russia-Ukraine war, but has also re resulted in revised estimates, which is now predicting a period during the budget statement to provide more relief to working families in Bermuda who have been negatively impacted by rising global inflation. In this fiscal year alone, we have increased support for financial assistance, reduced payroll tax for our workers, reduced vehicle licensing fees, increased pensions for our seniors, provided land tax to local charities and registered care homes, and froze the price of petrol and fuel at February levels. We are currently providing direct financial support to many of our parents, preparing to, preparing to offer a payroll tax rebate to 75% of our workforce. And tomorrow, the government will move to eliminate customs duty on all essential goods, which will result in more relief for working families. Despite the additional relief this government is providing to working families, 
and the additional investment in affordable housing, which is a critical need that will be announced by the Minister of Public Works tomorrow in the House of Assembly. It is expected that the government will meet the deficit target laid out in February of $70 million. When this deficit is combined with the deficit figures from last year, this will see the government's net debt lower than forecast during February's budget presentation. The facts are, government revenue is up, the government's deficit is decreasing, and our economy is growing, as evidenced by four consecutive quarters of GDP growth. As a government, however, we also understand that more must be done as we hear the concerns of many hardworking Bermudians. The cost of living in Bermuda must be addressed, but we must also make sure that we balance that by the responsible management of the governor's revenue and expenditures to ensure that we return to a balanced budget and put the government in place to start reducing Bermuda's national debt. Speaking of debt, I will now turn to matters related to the refinancing of government's debt. As stated in this year's budget statement delivered in the House of Assembly in February, a key challenge for the government was the almost $1 billion of debt that was coming due within the next two years. Over the summer, the government successfully refinanced the debt that would be maturing over the next two years and despite interest rates rising globally, managed to keep any interest increase in interest payments at a minimum, while ensuring that there is no need to access international debt markets until 2027. These achievements are important as the government is committed to continuing on a path to begin to reduce our debt within the next two years. The objective is clear. The less the government spends on servicing the country's debt, the more we can spend on servicing the people of Bermuda. By the time we go to the markets again in 2027, Bermuda's debt will be on a downward trajectory. As a result of our management of the country's finances and combined with the successful execution of Bermuda's economic recovery plan, we have not had to use the government's sinking fund balance for the management of ongoing cash needs to the extent originally projected. This therefore gives the government the option to repay the $50 million of Bermuda dollar debt outstanding next year without having to refinance this debt. And this will allow for further reduction in outstanding debt and is positive financial news. The successful execution of this refinancing initiative coupled with the recent positive assessment by independent ratings agencies and the strong economic growth reported by the Minister of Economy and Labor recently. Due to the successful execution of Bermuda's economic recovery plan reinforces the fact that Bermuda is on the right track. However, too often in Bermuda's history, the story has been purely the health of the government's balance sheet or the apparent skill at achieving some measure of fiscal discipline and accounting mastery. Yes, this is important, and it is something that the government will continue to aspire to. But a healthy and improved balance sheet must be used to support the people that we represent. It makes no difference to the struggling mother who is working two jobs to keep the lights on that the government reduces its deficit unless those savings and better than expected fiscal performance means relief for her and her family. Hard-working Bermudians have had to endure plenty of shared sacrifice since the global financial crisis. We've all experienced these difficult times, and it is high time that the taxpayers of this country benefit from shared success. This government's fiscal performance provides us with the scope to do just that. And as I promise in this year's budget statement, there will be relief now and more relief to come. As I said in the House of Assembly, this government will measure, outline further measures to return even more funds to working families in the coming weeks and will keep its promise to ensure that the shared success is not kept by the government but shared with the hardworking taxpayers of Bermuda to help working families cope with rising global inflation. Items under consideration for further relief are more support to parents of young children 
due to the crushing cost of health care. Consideration of further payroll tax rebates for working families, returning more hard-earned funds to the taxpayer of this country, and further measures to help deal with high energy costs. In keeping with our promise of more relief now and more relief to come, this past Friday, I announced that the Custom Tariffs Amendment Act 2022, which eliminates duty as high as 25% from 21 more essential goods, which includes items such as ground beef, chicken, bananas, cooking oil, as well as diapers, sanitary towels, tampons, laundry detergent, disc detergent, all things that are required for a family to survive will be eliminated. I know that there are those who are worried about how these savings will be passed on to consumers. But the Cost of Living Commission, under the able leadership of MP Derek Burgess, has been working hard to ensure that working families will see a reduction in the cost of staple goods. The Attorney General will be publishing regulations to ensure that the Cost of Living Commission can monitor the actions of grocers. And in addition, earlier today, I held a meeting with local grocers and wholesalers, along with members of the Cost of Living Commission. And I'm confident that the collaboration between the government, the Cost of Living Commission, will ensure that these reductions are felt by Bermudians at the till when purchasing essential items. As we announce new measures to assist Bermudian families with the cost of living, we are also ensuring that we will be following through on promises made previously. On July 15th, I announced a package that included $150 support for parents of public school students, LED light bulbs to reduce household energy costs, a 15% increase in the food allowance budget for the Department of Financial Assistance to support families in need, and a payroll tax rebate for 75% of Bermuda's workers. This payroll tax rebate included a $250 rebate for persons making less than $60,000 a year and a $100 rebate for persons making less than $96,000. The delay in administering these rebates was to ensure that we establish, as we establish such an innovative program, first time program, that we do so efficiently and responsibly to avoid any issues with the Auditor General when these funds are audited. We also want to ensure that the process is as smooth and efficient as possible, and we have that full understanding and cooperation of employers. Today, I can announce that application for these rebates will go live before the end of next week, with a deadline for applications set for December 15th of this year. Payments will be processed within 10 working days of receipt of a completed application, and further information on the process will be published on www.gov.bm in the coming days. As I mentioned earlier, as government's financial performance continues to improve, and as we consider the impact of this improved performance on the total budget, we may be able to increase the relief that we are providing to our beauty and families, and even possibly expand these rebates that we are giving to taxpayers. These are unprecedented times for Bermuda and countries throughout the world. But just as we rose to meet the challenge of a once-in-a-century pandemic, together this government will rise to meet the challenge of global inflation that has not been seen in 40 years. Bermudians can be assured that this government will meet this challenge and is committed to easing the burden of rising prices due to global inflation. We will outline further relief measures in the current weeks and will return more funds to working families who need it most. The government will keep its promise to ensure that government's improved financial results are shared with the hardworking taxpayers of this country as our economy continues to rebound and grow. Thank you, and I look forward to questions. talked about helping the, quote, single mother who has to work two jobs. 
who cannot afford to keep the lights on. People indulge me. But it, isn't it true that the majority of those who will benefit from the range of relief, tax rebates, school cash, etc., the majority don't fall into such an extreme category. In fact, my family falls into uh, the bracket uh, and uh, that can benefit. And while we appreciate the windfall, our lights will stay on either way. And I know we're not alone. Economist Craig Simmons on our report last night said this relief is broadcast, not targeted. If you really want to help the most needy, shouldn't you target the relief more specifically? Thank you for your question. My answer is that in this country, persons are struggling with the increase in costs of living. You go to the grocery store, other persons go to the grocery store and have seen the prices increase. What we are doing is, in a payroll tax rebate, returning tax dollars to those who have worked, who have earned money and have had to pay tax to the government. But the package of the, re the payroll tax rebates, which you may be eligible for, you may not be eligible for financial assistance and increase food support through financial assistance, increase energy support through financial assistance, because financial assistance meets those persons who have energy costs who they cannot meet and make ends meet. And so there are many aspects of government support. This is a wide package because the government has done, in my estimation, a very good job of making sure we provide support for the vulnerable, but there are people in this country who need relief all the time. There are those persons who, you know, maybe, uh, maybe um, working in tourism sectors and other sectors, not eligible for financial assistance, but still are having a challenge with the increasing costs of food. And that is the reason why we're making sure that we provide that on a broad basis, because we understand that there are many families that are struggling. The levels of struggle may be different, but the pressures and pains which are felt by 75% of Bermuda's workers are evident, and that is what the government is looking to address by returning taxpayer dollars to them. And on Friday, you said uh, the budget deficit is now projected $44 million lower than estimates, $14 million lower than the projections in July, when you first announced the relief package, following your plan to use half of the improvement to provide relief, you told them you'd be broadcasting things like more payroll relief, a land tax relief, you said it today, mm -hmm. are being discussed. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't this be the opportunity to maybe use a, a large portion of that seven million or so to target it directly on, on those people who really are struggling the most? Well, let me give you an example, because I think that we will. And one of the things that I spoke about in my statement today is the issue of childcare. And I tell the story because one of the things that I make sure to do as the leader of this government, continue to canvas, continue to reach out, continue to make myself accessible, and hear the stories from persons who were struggling to make ends meet. I spoke a few weeks ago to a single mother who is making $72,000 a year, but because she has a young child, the cost of childcare is crushing her. And because she makes $72,000, she doesn't qualify for the child tax care relief. But the fact is, she needs assistance. And that's why when we talk about the various pockets of assistance which are necessary, because we speak about a declining birth rate in the country, it's expensive to have children. When the Progressive Labor Party put in place the child tax credit in 2008, it was recognition of those dynamics. And so in discussions with the Minister of Economy and Labor, that's the reason one of the things I mentioned in here, there is a scope to expand that. And there is a large number of persons who have young children who are struggling to balance the cost of childcare. And that is something that can hit, as you say, the vulnerable, the ones that are struggling to make ends meet. So yes, we're going to make sure that these things are targeted because we are in touch and we understand the difficulties of which parents of young children are facing and others. Some may respond to things like that, that, that you spread the net wide mm -hmm. with this uh, uh, relief to hit more voters. How do you respond to that? I would say that the people of this country, everyone, whether they vote for me or not, whether they vote or not, are challenged by rising global inflation. Costs are increasing for everyone. And it is my belief that the government must make sure to be responsive to that and take action where we can take action. And what I said, where we said that half of improved performance will go back to the taxpayer in the form of relief, we are committed to making sure we deliver that. Because there's one thing that I know for certain, 
is that persons inside of this country need relief, need assistance, and that the government is going to make sure that we provide it. So, on the other side of this, our 3.35 billion debt lingers. Our debt service will go up 2 million a year with the recent refinancing, and debt service may go up again when we have to refinance other parts of our debt in four years' time. Uh, even if you pay off the, uh, the local 50 million, that's still 3.3 billion debt overall. Uh, and even if you achieve a surplus in three years' time, even if that surplus becomes 40 to 50 million a year, it would still take up to 60 years to clear our 3 billion plus debt using all the surplus to pay it off. Where's the plan to clear our debt rather than just manage it? Where's the tax reform? that will almost certainly be needed to do it. Tax reform is certainly a difficult process, um, but it is something that we're firmly committed to. And in the international tax agreements that the government has committed itself to, and with the bodies which have been working with the Ministry of Finance on the international side to make sure that we can structure something that works for Bermuda, um, I think that that is something that is important to be met. But on your question of debt, we have a gross debt of $3.35 billion, but we also have $300 million inside of our sinking fund and savings account. So our net debt is actually um, just about $3 billion. What is important is that we have a trajectory to get to a balanced budget, to build up our savings so we can pay off our debt. But at the same point in time, economic growth over time yields more tax revenue and more tax revenue allows the government more space to reduce this debt. If we are solely focused on reducing debt as quickly as possible, we will not make investments. Perfect example, when we see crumbling infrastructure, Tynes Bay, these are choices that we have to make. The government could elect to let Tynes Bay go out of commission and revert back to landfilling, or we can make the choice to make the investments which are necessary inside of our civil infrastructure. It is a balance, and it is both. The Fiscal Responsibility Panel, which is established to have an independent review of government finances, says that we have to lay out a path to achieve a budget surplus of at least $50 million, which will be helpful to make sure that we build up our savings to refinance debt, and debt will decrease over the long term. And that is the direction in which we go. However, I will say this. Continued successful execution of Bermuda's economic recovery plan combined by the investments which are necessary, especially in affordable housing in this country, to ensure that the cost of living does not increase. We'll see continued economic growth, and continued economic growth in this country, whether through tourism investment and others, will yield more tax revenue for the government, which will allow us to have more money to put aside to retire debt when it comes due. So what I'll say to that, Trevor, is this was something that we um, signaled, and this was actually something we wanted to get done in July. When we had reviewed the finance, when I came back to the Ministry of Finance, set the position that in any, any increased or better performance, half of that will be returned back to the taxpayer in the form of relief and making sure to target relief. We had wanted to do this in July. Um, and certainly I recognize the delay and the pain of which that caused. But the real reason why we, we had to delay was because we did not have a firm agreement with grocers to ensure that if we reduce pay, um, customs duty, that that savings would have been turned over to taxpayers, I mean, to turn over to the citizens of this country. And that's important because we have to learn from experience. In 2018, in the first budget that I delivered on behalf of the re-elected Progressive Labour Party government, we did reduce duty on a number of items. And the complaints were from persons that they did not see those price reductions reflected. So that is the reason why we took our time. 
Now, this would have been introduced a few weeks ago, but as you know, Parliament was delayed in sitting due to the hurricane and due to uh, the death of the Queen. So that is the reason uh, for uh, the timing. We did it as soon as we came back to Parliament. We had wanted to get it done in July, but we didn't have that agreement. And the last thing I want to do was to put something forward that did not have a plan together with it. And I just have to, while I say that, because as I said earlier, I just left the meeting with the tax reform, uh, not the tax reform commission, with the cost of living commission. And I have to praise the work of the cost of living commission under the leadership of MP Derek Burgess, who's done a great job. He took the medal and made sure that we have this agreement, which will see these costs redu reduce at the supermarkets for the residents of this country. situation mm -hmm. possible oil uh, issue. We will really see gas increase and uh increase at the in the fall of this this year. Um, thank you. One thing that I will point out, and I'm uncertain if a statement came out from the Ministry of Home Affairs yesterday, I know that he did speak with members of the media, uh, but the fuel adjustment rate actually as of October 1st has gone down by 17%. So that's certainly welcome news as the global increase in uh, gasoline prices has certainly affected many families. The government had committed in, um, in March to make sure that we froze gasoline at February levels. I rejected a price increase that was requested in March. And part of this relief package, of course, is to make sure that remains stable. Now, persons may say that affects everyone, but the fact is people have to travel. Businesses have to transport goods. Our tourism industry, where we're talking about our taxi drivers, where we're talking about our minibus drivers, all across our fishermen, et cetera, all those issues when it comes to the cost of fuel are important and affect them. So that relief will continue. We've looked at the forward um, oil prices to project how much that relief will continue to cost throughout this fiscal year. The good news is that the stronger dollar, um, even though gas prices have gone up a little bit from last year, it remains to be seen. It's disappointing with the OPEC oil cut, and we'll have to see where that filters through. But what the government is committed to doing is to making sure that we at least keep the price of the pump stable, and that will continue to remain at that level. If gas prices do happen to drop, these things are unpredictable. There could be, you know, prediction that with increasing interest rates, there's more likelihood of major economies having a slowdown, which can lead to a reduction of uh, longer-term gas prices, remains to be seen. But what the people of this country should know is that we are committed to keeping the price of the pump frozen at February levels, and if there is an opportunity to reduce it further, we will do that. As you just said, there were two hundred million dollars paid um, to date. How long will we continue to remain this company? Um, for for, for Acon, um, it's $40 million. Morgan's Point is $210 million. So the combined total of those two things of which we inherited is certainly 250. But on the Acon matter, you would recall that when we came into office, one of the things in which we pledged to do is to review the contract. And there was a press conference right in this very room. And you know, you can go back to the archives, the pictures, and, and the contract went from this side of the table all the way to that side of the table in 20 binders. And they were lawyers who poured through. The sad thing is that the former government and Skyport sealed that deal tight with no variances. Yes, the government could go to Parliament and invalidate the contract, but that would have serious repercussions to Bermuda as an international financial center, would see us in court for a while, would see us liable to um, penalties that could be $600, $700 million. So we are working through these issues, but it is a challenge. But as I said in my statement, this is why elections matter, because it was something that we campaigned against when we were in opposition. It was something that we said was not for the best spending of the country's money at this point in time. And we all remember we were told it won't cost us a dime. $40 million later, when we're talking about food prices, when we're talking about electricity prices, the amount of relief that could have been delivered to the people of this country, if the government did not have to send that to Skyport, who in turn, we see their parent company increasing their dividends this year, that's the challenge. But this is the box of which we are in. It is difficult for me to say that I'm not going to invalidate the contract as much as I may wish to, but the government has to be responsible, and we recognize that the overall impact of which they would have on our economy of going back on a contract to deal would be far worse than continuing to do the best as which we can with that deal. Thank you for the clarification. No problem. On the question, um, uh, nowhere on updates on um, uh, work for those 
that are not working. Unemployment, the levels, uh, numbers, mm -hmm. uh, any updates for those that are um, no problem. Thank you for answering that question. That's certainly something that I should have addressed and was in my statement. So I appreciate you for um, uh, bringing that up. One thing is that the cabinet actually yesterday did uh, pass an extension of the supplemental unemployment benefit to last until November 30th, which is the end of the public health emergency, uh, which is scheduled. Um, there's only about 39 persons in the country which are now still on the supplemental unemployment benefit, but those persons still are having difficulty making ends meet. The biggest employment project that will happen in this country is the commencement of the construction at Fairmont Southampton. I'm pleased to share that we did agree to revise as a terms in August. I didn't announce that because, you know, I'm making sure that all things are tied up as financial markets still. But last week we had confirmation of the funding from both um, funding sources overseas, and the lawyers have been working diligently on the closing documents. Hopefully the contract will not be as long as the contract for the airport, but we're confident that uh, that, that process will complete soon and construction will be able to start. And the thought of 700 construction jobs happening would certainly be very welcome. No problem. I, I, I got you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the basket of essential goods, there are some items in there such as uh, eggs, such as milk, and other items that were already at a 0% duty rate. Um, so they're already at a 0% duty rate. The ones that were not at a 0% duty rate are going to be reduced to a 0% duty rate as part of that customs tariff amendment. But what is important to note is that the work of the Cost of Living Commission, and this is following on from the question uh, from Mr. Lindsay from TNN, was to make sure that if we're going to provide this relief, because what we wanted to see are items like eggs, items that like apples and oranges, which are already at 0% duty, to be reduced further. And that was the work that MP Derek Burgess and the Cost of Living Commission was engaged in through the summer to make us get to an agreement with the retailers so we'll be able to see a reduction on even the goods that are not subject to the duty reductions which are coming into place. So I think that that is something that we look forward to sharing with the people of this country in the House Assembly tomorrow. And I certainly, again, want to give credit to MP Derek Burgess for his fine work in this commission because following my meeting with the retailers and wholesalers earlier today, they had reiterated their commitment to working with the Cost of Living Commission, and we will see those goods that aren't even, that were already at 0% duty, to have that reduction of at least 10% at the, um, at the uh, supermarkets. So that is certainly welcome news. Okay, um, just to go back to Gary's um, original point, um, you've been critical of the Cabinet for not giving you the resources that you haven't targeted resources properly into two scattergun. How would you respond to that? Have you failed to actually get a grip on the resources you have so that they could help people most in need rather than the rich? What I would say is I don't believe that people making $96,000 and under in any way, shape, or form can be considered rich. And so I don't accept that characterization uh, because life in Bermuda, especially with the increase in food costs, high energy costs, which fortunately will begin to see some relief with reduction in the fuel adjustment rate, which is coming to place on October 1st, but also the pressures which are being felt in the housing market. Um, so there is a need to provide a wide swath of relief, but at the same point in time, we're also providing targeted relief, increasing the funding for financial assistance so they can meet the challenges which are there, extending the supplemental unemployment benefit for those persons who cannot, um, you, who are unable to find work and are still challenged from the pandemic. So I think that to focus on the broad-based relief misses the fact that there are other measures of relief which are being put into place, which are being expanded and being supported. We have always done a good job, I think, of you know taking care of the vulnerable, making sure that they have access to financial assistance with seniors with pension increases and the uh, support that they can get through financial assistance and to make sure to increase those budgets. But there is a wider swath of persons, as people say, the forgotten middle class, those persons who don't normally get relief from government, who I think deserve it. They pay taxes and the payroll tax rebate is a way to make sure that money is returned to their pockets. Um, you mentioned stamp duty. Um, 
stand duty men that I ask <laughs> about before I leave tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to uh, get rid of stand duty for first time buyers only, paying less than $750,000. Mm -hmm. um, could you just talk me through how that's going to benefit everybody in the country? Obviously, it's going to benefit those individual people. And also, the, um, the, the payroll, payroll taxes where it will go up by um, 0.5% for people earning between 48 and 96. Just what's the thing behind that and, and, and how that helps? Well, I can tell you that the Payroll Tax Amendment Act tomorrow does not include any tax increases. What the Payroll Tax Amendment Act tomorrow is doing is to making sure to clarify that gratuities which are earned are not subject to payroll taxes. This has been something that has been raised by our union partners, raised by persons who are working in the tourism industry, and that is to make sure we clarify those facts. Also, what we saw is that there were certain summer students who were working, and due to the fact that they were not working in government and other places, there was a question as to whether or not they should pay payroll tax. And one thing that I certainly want to make sure as we do is provide relief to summer students, so that is to make sure that it's clarified in law that they are not subject to payroll tax. So the payroll tax bill that is coming to place tomorrow does actually create relief, and there is certainly no increase in taxes that is included in the Payroll Tax Amendment Act. Allow me to finish and get to stamp duties, Mr. Connell so I can answer your question. On the issue of uh, the Stamp Duty uh, Amendment Act, uh, the $750,000 um, exemption for first-time home buyers was already in law. What this is is to clarify certain provisions around that and also to make sure that there is no question in law as to whether or not those mortgages could be transferred and additional stamp duty has to be paid on the transfer of those mortgages. So the amendments that are coming, they aren't major, they are more technical amendments to clear up some misunderstanding, to make sure that the intent of government policy is fully reflected in law and those things can be cleared up. It's, it's the whole stamp duty, is it? It's just compensating, it's the abolition of stamp duty completely. So you are clear. Stamp duty was eliminated on first-time home buyers under $750,000 about 15 years ago. So this is not something that is new. This is clarifying certain provisions inside of there because there is some confusion when it comes to people refinance their mortgages. If they are one particular bank and they want to move their mortgage to a particular bank, whether or not they have to pay in stamp duty on that. And what we're trying to do is to simplify that process to make it easier for those persons who were first-time homeowners who may have been in that situation to be able to shop in the market for lower rates. And um, obviously, on cost of living, probably the easiest way to alleviate it is to create more jobs, better paid jobs for um, mm -hmm. the medians. You mentioned with them on Southampton. Um, you made it sound at the beginning of April like the steel was in, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, 800 families would mm -hmm. see something get, get a job. Mm -hmm. what, what has been the, the continued delay in getting over the line? Happy to speak to that. What has been the continued delay has been the turmoil in international markets. We have had a very, very, very difficult space in international markets. And so from that particular perspective, um, the financiers had to make sure because things have to be repriced. Interest rates have shot up. We've seen turbulence in international markets, and that is the reason. However, we've come to closing. We've come to closing now, um, and the closing documents are being worked through. So absolutely, it is a delay. The cabinet re approved the revised sets of terms in August of 2021. We are now moving. We have commitments that are signed by the uh, overseas financiers who had to increase the amount of money because, of course, as time goes, costs, um, supply chain issues are there. There's additional money that's had to put in the deal. The um, persons have had to put additional money into the deal. The government has not had to put anything additional into the deal. I should make that clear. But those are the commitments that are required by the lenders in order to make this work. And I want to make sure I remind that this project of which we're talking about, which is now in excess of a $400 million project, the significant majority of the financing from this project is coming from overseas, which is not something that we've seen in any hotel development today. Thank you, Mr. Pelley. I don't believe that's accurate, but that might be your opinion. Finally, um, uh, the, the, the TA form getting rid of that, will, will, there's still some confusion about whether there'll still be a payment you know, when that goes. Um, what I can say is that when the travel authorization does end, um, and I do believe that budget targets will be met, um, there will not be any further payment. Um, I thought that Ms. Cupman, Ms. Talbot said to defer to Ms. Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Springer. You mentioned about the $150 for the school. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the 
no school, no problem, no schools. Why was there no um, add-ons for, for private school? Um, I've answered that question before. It was a decision of the governor at that time to make sure that we could size appropriately what the relief would be. But as the amounts of relief that comes in, the Minister of Education may consider to come back in to expand that. And if he does, that will be something that will be shared uh, with the country. Um, we, we, we recognize that there are some persons who will feel hard done by. There are some persons that felt left out. In every single decision in which the government makes, that's where it is. Governing is not easy. And so I don't want people to think that, oh, we're just doing this, oh, we're just doing that. It gets back to the question that Gary had asked, uh, you know, about, you know, wh whether or not the pie is being, or the relief is being spread too wide. Persons across the board are being challenged with expenses, and this government will do whatever it can to make sure we provide their relief. So thank you for asking that question. Which the ones who've already applied? The ones who've already applied? That, they are currently being processed. Um, there is no question about that. There are some serious challenges. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say there are serious challenges. What I'll go in so far as to say that the Ministry of Finance has had experience during the unemployment benefit and the difficulty with dealing with the Auditor General when it comes to the auditing of those funds. So they're just making sure that they don't run into any audit difficulties later, which unfortunately is slowing the process. It is incredibly frustrating for me and frustrating for families, frustrating for the Minister of Education. But we do live in a society where we are subject to audits. We are making sure that the, there is an independent office of the Auditor General. And so that is part of the reason for uh, the delays. We're looking to make sure that can be streamlined for uh, the payroll tax rebate. Thank, Thank you for your questions. Mr. Premier, we have one final question, and then we will wrap up our screening from Gary Skelton mm -hmm. from Broadcasting. Just to... Uh, Back on my media colleagues, uh, questions about the Fairmont Sun Southampton. Mm -hmm. You said that, and obviously, some uh, looking some things are costing more because of the markets, etc. Absolutely. I wanted to know has there been any change to the government guarantee on the Fairmont Southampton deal? If so, how much? No change at all. As I said in my answer to the question, no additional commitments from the government of Bermuda. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mass Media, for joining us this afternoon. That concludes our press briefing. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone.